Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize up front for the perhaps dubious audio quality of this uh, video. I, I, I plugged this microphone into my laptop here and it just doesn't want to recognize it. So I'm probably going to, you know, you're going to be hearing the buzz of the laptop or something that, you know, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, last I left off. I'm looking at Mary Ann Evans roughly in the years 1854 and 1855. Remember, last I left off, Mary Ann Evans uh, was working as a editor at the magazine, The Westminster Review, which was owned by John Chapman. And uh, she was basically uh, working for room and board, which meant she lived in the apartment with John Chapman above the offices of the Westminster Review. <laughs> well, well, in 1854, late 1854, uh, her new boyfriend, John, uh, George Henry Lewis, uh, convinces her to tell John Chapman to take this job and shove it. I am not working uh, this drudgery job of editor at your lousy magazine anymore. Uh, instead, I'm going to run off to the Weimar Republic with my new boyfriend, George Henry Lewis, uh, and uh, translate some German for him for his upcoming book on German philosophy. <laughs> so it seems at this time everybody wants to take advantage of Marianne Evans and her, um, her, her intellectual and linguistic gifts. Let's just put it that way. Anyway, uh, she runs off to the Weimar Republic in late 1854 and stays until March of 1855 when she returns back to, to London. And it seems that this trip to the Weimar Republic had a real significant impact on her writing style, um, an impact in general. Let's just put it this way. The next 10 or so articles that she submits to various uh, literary and li intellectual magazines in London were inspired by this trip to the Weimar Republic. Um, and I think it left an impact on her writing style, which I'll go over briefly here. Uh, the first article that she submits for the leader is a book review of something by Adolf Storr, um, the title of which I shall not attempt to pronounce because it is German. <laughs> But um, in English, it is translated The Art of the Ancients. You can find uh, Adolf Storr and The Art of the Ancients on archive.org, and it appears that it's never been translated into English. Uh, it is German. But it is, Adolf Storr appears to have been um, one of these uh, travel authors. He wrote about Greece, he wrote about Italy, and apparently he was pretty popular in the Weimar Republic at the time. So this book, The Art of the Ancients, is, again, a travelogue of ancient Greece and uh, the art and architecture of that time. Well, I looked through this book on archive.org, and there's no pictures in this book that I can see anyway, just scanning through it. I mean, it's 1855, so yeah, there's not going to be any photographs uh, in this book, but even wood carvings, you know, the, the, the etchings that were used at that time uh, to, to describe the art and architecture of, let's say, you know, the, the Parthenon and stuff like that. It is described in this book. It doesn't appear to be in there, so it relies entirely on the descriptive power uh, of, of writing to describe, to paint in the mind's eye, art and architecture, which, which must be re really difficult to do. Uh, but this is what was done in Victorian era, or um, even during this time in the Weimar Republic. This is what was done. I mean, Marianne Evans at this time typically trashes German writers. She, <laughs> she is, um, she's impressed by their, by their uh, scholarship. And she translates the books based on that scholarship. But she says as literary products, they, they more or less suck. Germans can't write. They're great scholars or terrible writers. So, for instance, in her translations of Ludwig Feuerbach, her translation of David Friedrich Strauss, her translations are typical of George Eliot or Marianne Evans. Uh, from a literary standpoint, they are beautifully written. But from what I understand, the German from which these translations come are terrible. 
Again, brilliant scholarship, terrible writing. <laughs> so that, that's typically what you get from Marianne Evans. But she, uh, but when it comes to Adolf Storr, she says that the descriptions that he that Adolf Storr has are are beautifully done. Again, you have to paint art into the mind of the reader, which must be ridiculously hard to do. And that brings to mind something that um, a common critique of modern readers of Victorian era literature or literature of the 19th century in general. It's that it is overly descriptive. It is verbose. It is wordy. And um, yeah, that's true. It is. Um, but remember, uh, this is my common comeback to that argument, is that during this time, remember, photo photographs, photography are what? 10 years old as an invention? I mean, wood carvings were used as illustrations in books. And uh, that was a, that's a, a pretty expensive process to do, uh, to commission artists to sketch wood etchings to put on a printing press to put in to, to put illustrations in books at this time. So authors during this time were faced with readers who don't have the luxury we have of being pummeled with photographs of everything or you know seeing these motion pictures in front of us or anything like that. You know, we, we have these images in our minds just from other media. Back then they didn't. So the author had to be very skilled in, in descriptive writing. That's why George Eliot is so wordy. That's why she has these lengthy introductions to her books like Romola and Mill on the Floss where the first couple of chapters are nothing but setting the stage. Um, American authors, German authors, they, they all did this back in those days. So. Marianne Evans appreciates that style of writing in this German work. Um, let me read a bit of this book review where Adolf Storr describes some of the torturous history of Grecian architecture. Here's what she says. The chapters on Phidias and his works include a survey of the sculptures of the Parthenon, which, alas, are the only works immediately and unquestionably his now remaining. A description of what the Parthenon was in its glory and the history of its sad fate. It is exasperating to think that after surviving the bigotry of early Christianity, the inroads of northern barbarians, the crusading adventures of the Middle Ages, who as Duke of Athens made the Acropolis their citadel, nay, the Turkish conquest over Omar, the Parthenon was, at last, nearly at the end of the 17th century, blown into fragments in a siege conducted by Konigsmark, the German general of the Venetian army. The Turkish Pasha had deposited all his treasures and ammunition in the Parthenon, which had hitherto served him as a mosque. A bomb fell into the powder magazine, and the temple which had stood in its beauty two thousand years was a heap of ruins, etc. Um, when I read descriptions like that of the history of the Parthenon, written by young Marianne Evans, um, it brings to mind something that she wrote ten years after this, which was the introduction to Romola, where... Uh, a specter is seen given a, a, a history of Florence in much this style of language. So yeah, um, I do think that this trip to the Weimar Republic really did influence her, literary, liter, uh, her later literary output. Uh, so anyway, this was a short book review. The next book review uh, is much longer. Uh, it's something that she's going to write about the memoirs of the court of Austria. And then she's got um, uh, uh, a travel article about her months in the Weimar Republic. All that's coming up. So yeah, I'm a little obsessive, but I'm going to go through it all. <laughs> anyway, um, you guys take care. How do I
turn this off. I can't work my microphone. I can't work my camera. There we go.